there we are, the flintlock musket was used again by both the King's armies. It saw service here at the battle, but there were not just as many of them here as there would have been at the French Lords. And the reason for that was that they were considerably more expensive to produce. Now, ammunition. The soldiers carried their ammunition in a belt. And this is known as a belt of charges. It's also known as a bandolier. Belt of charges simply because each little bit wooden bottle of sufficient gunpowder for one shot, and one shot is one charge of powder. So each little wooden bottle, if it's properly oiled and waxed or varnished, then it will provide a weatherproof container in which to keep your powder dry, even on the very wettest of days. It's a very efficient piece of equipment. The little purse contains the, the projectile, and the projectile in the form of little round lead balls. There we are. Musket balls. Please get off the fence. Oh, look. Uh... Musket balls, little soft round lead balls. about 19 millimeters. If I had 12 of them in my hand, and that tells me that this size of ball is a size from which a pound of lead will produce 12 balls. And what that actually tells me is that the bore of my musket is a 12 bore, or a 12 gauge. And many of you are into modern shotguns. Uh, you'll be well familiar with the 12 ball or 12 gauge. And just goes to show you that um, even in the 21st century, we're still using 17th century musket calibers. So nothing really changes, does it? Now, the last thing here is a little powder flask. And this uh, will contain some finely ground gunpowder, which the soldiers would use to prime the pan of his musket. Uh, this will work equally well with either a matchlock or a flintlock. And certainly, if you've been into the house, you will have seen the illustrations, and you will know that this is a pretty common piece of equipment, again carried by both the King's armies. It had been in service in various forms for over a hundred years by the time 1690 came around. And it was an efficient piece of equipment. It was simple to use, it was safe to use. It was reliable and well enough liked by the soldiers. However, by 1690, it was becoming old-fashioned. Becoming old-fashioned quite simply because the military itself was changing. New types of soldiers coming onto the battlefield. And amongst these new soldiers, we had a group of soldiers known as dragoons. Now, dragoons were a mounted infantryman. They were soldiers who would ride on the back of a horse into action, hop off their horses and fight on foot. In fact, these soldiers today, we call them a quick response unit. And you'd see them coming in on their helicopters, hopping out of the helicopters and getting into fight. But 1690, the soldiers would be riding on horses. And if you're riding on a horse, you know, you, you do bounce around a lot. So if you were riding on a horse, wearing a bandolier, started to go fast, <laughs> you'd be bouncing around and all of a sudden your ammunition belt is in some disarray. There are a number of the bottles which are open and the contents would be spilled. The bottles jiggling and rattling in behind the horse's ears wouldn't make uh, for a happy horse. So this is not good equipment for a horse soldier, very good for an infantryman. But as I said, warfare was changing. So this led to the introduction of a new type of ammunition, an ammunition carried in bags over the soldiers' shoulders. And this is a little paper package, paper package containing not just the gunpowder, but also containing the bullet. And this is the, the first type of cartridge, this is the paper cartridge. 
paper cartridges were carried also by the armies of King William and the armies of King James. In fact, actually, just a little bit off the, the beaten track. Anybody do any sketching or painting or drawing? Mm. Not any budding artists amongst you? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, the next time, in fact, any of you are into the artist supply shop, or into some of the big stationery shops, have a look at the artist's materials and have a look at sketch pads. It says on it, fine quality cartridge paper. And that's because the weight of paper that we use today for artist materials is the type of paper that was used to make paper cartridges from. And that's because the nature of the paper tears easy. And uh, it's very tough and very strong. But when it comes to opening them, it's pretty efficient. Now, cartridge containing the, the powder and the ball. The soldier will have the musket in his left hand and the cartridge in his right. So the only way now that he has left with which to open his cartridge are to rip it open with his teeth. Oh. And this is where to commit to taking action, to commit to loading up his musket, the soldier has to bite the bullet and get on with it. Yeah. And I'm sure you've heard that expression, to bite the bullet. Yes. So, I'm about to bite the bullet, but uh, I do have to confess and say that I don't actually have any bullets in these. away on the lead ball now, oh. chewing away, not even worrying about the lead poisoning, <laughs> because in the 17th century they'd never heard of lead poisoning, and what you don't know don't hurt you. <laughs> so okay, cartridge is now open, I empty the entire contents into the muzzle of the firearm, and that's why these are called muzzle loaders. The powder falls all the way down to the breech, touch hole. The paper is simply scrunched up, pushed in, and it acts as wadding. Now remember, of course, I'm still sucking on the lead ball. I have to remember to spit it into the ball. So there we are. I'm all loaded up. I'm not primered yet, and that's purely a safety consideration in case I go off at half cock and blow some of your heads off. <laughs> Now, talking of safety, the reason I go out to the little red flag is that we've carefully calculated the safe sign distances. And I know that if you remain safely behind the barriers, and I'm out at the red flag, then I'm not going to death you. But what I am going to do is I'm going to take it out and I'm going to try two or three shots and let you see it operating. So if you want to take a few photographs, this is the moment. <laughs> okay, folks, I think you're all safe enough. <laughs> cool. <laughs> Again. Ma lei vuole era così per tutti. Ma è così? Ma è così? Ma è così? Ma è così? Ma è Pretty smoky, pretty noisy, and fairly reliable. Everything went off, and if you'd have typed me three shots, I should be able to get three shots off in a minute. Take too long. And remembering, of course, that in the 17th century, the speed is relevant. Uh, it's not like racing cars and fast flying jet aircraft. The 
fastest thing on the battlefield is a galloping horse. And mostly battles are conducted at the pace of a walking man. One thing I would like you to think about, and I would like you to use your imagination. That was only me. <laughs> One man. Lots of smoke. Lots of noise. Back in 1690, I wouldn't be just the one man. I would be a member of a regiment, and a regiment would be anything from 600 to 900 men, all lined up. And you wouldn't just have one regiment. You'd have two, three, four, maybe five regiments, all shooting. And then you'd have the enemy, who would have the same number of men all shooting back at you. So at any one time, you could have two, three, four, maybe 5,000 men shooting. And if you can imagine the volume of smoke that would be generated, and certainly at the noise that would be generated, it's quite phenomenal. Now that's all uh, brought home to the fact that these are really short, short range weapons. Their maximum effective range is somewhere between 100 and 150 yards. No, <laughs> really, the distance between where you're standing uh, 100 and two beech trees. It's from here to these two trees. It's probably yes. the maximum effective range. When I say effective range, it's a range at which, when you strike your target, the ball is capable of doing damage. And the ball coming out of this is probably strong enough to strike not just the man in the front rank but possibly the person standing behind him. Hmm. So the ball is capable of blowing a hole right through someone. Big, powerful uh, lead balls. Now, the one thing about them is that, uh, well, actually, if you take the... Oh, take the red beach, the, the copper beach, and if I can ask for a volunteer to go down and stand underneath the tree, and I'd have a few shots. <laughs> eh? safe enough, because the only way that I can strike you at that range would be by pure accident. <laughs> These are so inaccurate that I couldn't guarantee to even hit the tree. <laughs> because as the ball's coming out, it's wobbling around a bit, and it's bouncing around when it leaves the muzzle. So I have no control over which direction. Well, I have control over the direction, but I have no pinpoint control on accuracy. There's no rifling in them, they're smooth bore. But in the 17th century, that didn't matter. And it didn't matter because I would not be shooting at one person. I'd be shooting at regiments. And three or four regiments of men, three or four thousand men, standing underneath the beech trees, would extend right over to the chestnut tree and possibly onto the bank. And even I could hit a target that big. And it wouldn't just be me that would be shooting. I'd have thousands of my mates as well. So you would have thousands of men shooting at thousands of men and you're bound to do damage because that's where the battle would be. When the battle would start, you would be standing there with your regiments and the enemy would be formed up all the way across from the beech trees over to the, the chestnut tree. They would start shooting at you and you would start shooting at them. You'd be all lined up in your lines with the flags flying and the drums beating shoot, both of you would advance a little bit closer, then you would shoot again, then you would advance a little bit closer, and you would shoot again, until eventually you got so close, you'd turn your muskets round, you would advance and start passing out all those headaches. <laughs> because the main fighting at a battle in the 17th century was basically hand-to-hand -hand fighting. Musketry was carried out at a distance to try and break the ranks of the enemy. The actual hand-to-hand -hand fighting was what finished off and sorted the battle. Now there we are, folks. That's all that I have for you by way of a formal presentation. I am here for a few minutes longer, and if you have any questions that you'd like to ask me, I'll try and answer them for you. So do we have any questions? Yes. And their hash on the other side, white paper. I was just wondering about that. Just is it that they wouldn't shoot a man on their own side? Well, you, you 
the lady's asking uh, why did they wear things in their hats and was that to avoid confusion between friend and foe? And the reason for that was if you think about the amount of noise and the volume of smoke, and if you look at what I'm wearing, it's a pretty distinctive and it is a regimental coat. It enables uh, folk to recognize my regiment at a distance and know which side I'm on. But actually, the reason I wear this uniform coat is because I want to be fairly neutral. And the coat that I'm wearing is that which represents my Lord Galmoy's regiment of dragoons fighting uh, with uh, King James. But if I were to go to the other side of the river, the same uniform coat is worn by Henry Cunningham's regiment of dragoons, which were raised in Enniskillen, and they were fighting for good King William. So immediately I think you can see that if you're two opposing regiments, there is, there is going to be confusion. And uh, where it came about, the, the idea of the emblems on the hats, now I'm not quite sure how that was decided. Somebody told me that uh, Willie got hold of Jimmy's phone number the night before the battle and they decided on what their away colours would be. Yeah. And the reason that James chose the, the white was that he was being supported by his cousin, King Louis of France. And King Louis was King Louis, Louis XIV, Louis XIV, was a Bourbon, a Sun King, the emblem of purity and the symbol of whiteness was the emblem of purity for Bourbon France. So he wore French colours, and William's troops, because he had been fighting for a long time on the continent against Louis, had uh, elected to wear, in fact, in the fields of Flanders, they wore oak leaves in their hats. So this, this green stems from the battling in the fields of Flanders. And it just goes to show you that even uh, on the 12th of July, William's away colour wasn't orange, it was green. <laughs> Does that answer your question? Yeah, and it was simply because of confusion. Yes, young man. I can't hear you. Uh, were they? Well, there was, there's two different sizes. The ones I'm using for these are 12 bore. There's a smaller ball known as a 16 bore. And that was usually French guns. French troops. Actually, we had French troops fighting on both sides because French troops uh, from Louis' uh, Catholic armies were in support of King James. But yet, on the other side, we had the French uh, Protestant Huguenots who were fighting for William. So, we had two different sizes of balls, big ones and little ones. And the man told me, he says, that the Englishman's balls are always bigger than the Frenchman's. <laughs> Sorry. Any other? Yeah. Say again. Yes. The soldiers would be capable of making them themselves. They'd have little molds and they'd pour them. Lead melts at a very low temperature, about sort of 700 degrees, and you can have a little campfire and melt your lead and pour it into the molds. But yes, uh, they would have had factories in England and in Ireland, which would have been mass producing musket balls. The soldiers had to know what to do, and they had to know how to do it themselves. Hmm? They, were, they were all round lead balls. Everything was a round lead ball. Even the cannonballs are round, but they're not lead, they're solid iron, cast iron. The cannons there are two culverns in front of the house, and they would shoot a six pound solid iron shot, uh, some distance, slightly in excess of one mile. So the, the bridge, you could probably bounce cannonballs off the bridge to far as you can do the ice. At this time, you didn't have exploding shells, because they hadn't been invented yet. Exploding artillery shells didn't come around until the late 17th century, late 18th century, when they were developed uh, by a gentleman known as Henry Shrapnel. I'm sure many of you have heard that name before. So he was an artillery officer, royal artillery officer, and he served in the Peace. Uh, what about the bayonet? The bayonet? Yes, well, the bayonet is a, is a new innovation in 17th century warfare. It was developed in France, uh, and the first bayonets 
were manufactured for the French military in a little village called Bayonne. And hence the bayonet was, was born. Okay. And the bayonet at this time was what's known okay. as a plug bayonet because it plugs into the musket. And uh, when the English troops saw the Frenchmen using their bayonets, the Frenchmen would carry them high. And the English called them French pikes. And the reason they carried them high was because they were designed for use against the horses. Now that's not to say you can stop a horse with a bayonet. You not do that because a horse weighs over half a ton. But what you can do now, if you saw the horse out earlier, you'd have seen the horseman, the sword, lopping all your heads off. At least what I can do now is I can reach the horseman and I can defend myself against that sword. So the bayonet was introduced for the protection of the foot soldier against the horse soldier. For to a man in the 17th century, your most dangerous and your most powerful enemy was a mounted soldier and his most powerful weapon was his horse. Okay. Oh, just one other thought actually. You're talking about the bayonet. By all of the accounts that we have, the first time that the bayonet was used offensively in Ireland was here. And the field's just down there because when the Blue Guard crossed the river, they were immediately attacked by the Irish cavalry. The Blue Guard was the William Mike Royal Guard. And they held the horsemen away by standing shoulder to shoulder and keeping the horses out with their bayonets. And lady? What is the... The cabbage. That's a cauliflower. <laughs> yes. Um, well, next, next thing out at uh, 2 o'clock, we have a cookery demonstration. <laughs> and we're going to show you how to make cauliflower cheese. <laughs> but there's a rather specialist way of chopping up the cauliflower, and we have to bring the horsemen in. <laughs> and they ride around it and chop up it with their big swords. <laughs> I would have liked to have been able to blow it off with my musket, but uh, they won't let me do that. <laughs> okay, folks. Uh, that's good. Uh, the, the horsemen, the cavalry, uh, would have carried pistols, which were not very accurate or much about say 15 to 20 yards, they were pretty well useless. On the back of a horse, you don't have much uh, chance of hitting what you're shooting at. Uh, carbines, which are a shorter version of this, were used and they were introduced certainly for the dragoons, uh, but that would have been in the middle of the 18th century, sort of the 1760s there uh, At this time, you either rode on the horse as a cavalryman and used your pistols, or you rode as a dragoon and you hopped off your horse and you fought on foot. So you weren't actually using long guns or fighting horses. But as time went by, newer firearms evolved, shorter ones, which made them suitable for use on, a, on the back of a horse. They had to be short for getting on and off, and they also had to be short that you could reload them. Okay. Thank you. Okay, folks. Thank you. Christophe. Christophe. Oh, that's Italian. I know.